for the record, uh, quorum is present. So members, uh, first of all, uh, what we're gonna do is uh, we've uh, got the privilege of having the Marshall High School uh, FFA, some members here today, and uh, we'd wanna welcome to, you to our Ag Committee. And uh, if it would work, maybe we'd just have your officers come up to the table and uh, identify yourself and what office position you hold. And uh, welcome to our committee. Uh, before we uh, get started on our agenda, we appreciate having you here and uh, appreciate the FFA. My name is my name is Braxton Seifert. I'm a treasurer at Marshall FFA, and I'm a junior. Braxton. My name is Noah Kudrin. I'm a sophomore, and I'm the president at my name is Aaron nope. Newman, and I am the reporter, and I'm a 10th grader. Okay, Aaron. My name is John Borbum. I am the secretary at Marshall FFA, and I am a junior. Uh, my name is Mary Lanou. I'm a 10th grader, and I'm the vice president. My name is Mallory Evans. I'm a 10th grader, and I am the sentinel. Hi, folks. My name is John Shears. I'm the Marshall FFA advisor. Very good. Impressive group of... Uh... Young men and women. Uh, members, any questions for them while we've got them on the hotspot? <laughs> oh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Dames. I don't have a question, but I do want to thank the officers from Marshall for coming and joining us uh, today at the Ag Committee and uh, also thank them for introducing themselves and being at the Capitol. Thank the advisor for all your work and you folks for all what you do. Thank you. Very good. Chair. Yes. Mr. Chair, I'll just have Senator a question. Anderson, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to the members, uh, how many of you are on the path to becoming state farmers? Any of you? How many other? Four, five, five? Great, four or five. Okay. Well, I appreciate your leadership and look forward to seeing you on the, the, the roll when the state uh, acknowledges you as, your, as a state farmer for the state of Minnesota. Thank you. And uh, I know uh, I know there's uh, both members on the Democrat and Republican side of this committee, uh, myself included, that were uh, FFA members in high school. So uh, you never know where it might lead. You and uh, we use parliamentary procedure that you guys learn in FFA uh, all the time here. So uh, when some wonder if it's uh, relevant, uh, you can tell them it is. So. Hey, thank you guys so much for coming and your interest in agriculture and uh, being a spokesman for, for rural Minnesota, but really agriculture across, across our state and country. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members, uh, um, great to have uh, uh, high school interest and uh, the FFA uh, so relevant to our Ag Committee. So uh, that's, that's great that that Senator Dames, that uh, they were able to come in, and uh, thanks for uh, representing that area. Um, members, we're going to first start with um, a few, uh, bringing up a few um, confirmation uh, motions, and then uh, we've got a couple bills after that to have hearings. And so uh, the confirmation motions are related to the hearings we held last week. And so uh, we've got uh, Dean Comparts uh, on the phone or uh, on Zoom. Uh, we've told him we don't need to ask him any questions or, or have him talk, but I want to acknowledge that he's uh, he is on. Is that... And uh, um, and then members uh, will will do separate motions. Uh, at this point, that the intention uh, of the committee is to uh, pass a, a recommendation of three of the uh, members that we've heard last week. Um, and so that, that will be what we start with. Uh, Mr. Comparts, uh, are you on Zoom? And uh, I understand the other two members are, are at a, a national convention out in Indianapolis uh, with uh, Dr. Thompson as well. So uh, they may not be able to join us today, but we certainly understand that we had good, a good time with them last week. But uh, Mr. Comparts, if you wanna just uh, say hi and um, Sure. introduce yourself briefly but you don't have to go through any any uh resume uh, as we had that last july but uh, just just to give you 30 seconds to uh greet our committee and uh yep. and members will move ahead with that motion well uh thank you for the opportunity senator uh westrom 
Uh, I have, uh, my name is Dean Compart. I'm from Nicollet, Minnesota. I'm part of a family owned and operated um, business that involves breeding stock. Um, we produce a, a number of market pigs that are sold under our own family uh, branded pork label Compart Family Farms. And uh, uh, I, I've enjoyed my time that I've been on the Minnesota Board of Animal Health. I find it to be, you know, challenging work. I feel that probably some of the background that uh, our family has been through with respect to disease and managing our way through disease, around disease, and so forth has probably given me a perspective that uh, that uh, is has been beneficial. I would hope to uh, uh, the process of being involved with the Minnesota Board of Animal Health. Uh, and so I guess I don't have a lot else. I've, like I said, I've enjoyed it. I've been the chair of it for like the last three years. And, and just kind of a quick note in passing, the Lanou name is a very, very well-known name, not to our family. We've uh, worked with Lanou, the Lanou families uh, selling pigs to them for many, many years. And I know there was one of the FFA individuals who was recognized as a Lanou and uh, a family name, again, that uh, we've uh, identified with for many, many years. So. So that's maybe all I have, unless you guys have anything else for me. Uh, I'll, I'll check and see. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Comparts. Uh, glad you could join us and uh, hope, uh, hope your experience with the pigs and drawing blood last week uh, went okay. So, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that got kind of lengthy. I got home about 8.30 and uh, was pretty stiff and pretty sore. <laughs> <laughs> None of us envied you, just so you yeah. know. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, members, any any questions for Mr. Comparts? And otherwise, um, uh, uh, Senator French is not here. Otherwise, uh, right now, so I was going to have him move the motion. But uh, Senator Dornick, uh, I'll call on you for for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to recommend uh, confirmation of appointment of Dean Compart to the Board of Animal Health. Very good, uh, Senator uh, Dornick has uh, moved. The confirmation of uh, Dean Compart for the Board of Animal Health. Uh, members, any questions for Mr. Compart or uh, other comments or discussion to the motion? Senator French is French just walking in. We're going to wait for Senator French. I was going to have you make the motion, and now Senator Dornick beat you to it. So uh, we're just in the middle of. Um, confirming uh, Dean Compart for the Board of Animal Health. So um, any any comments or questions? Uh, we're just in any discussion right now. So I know Ms. Uh, Senator French. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, we could hardly have a better candidate for this role in front of us. Mr. Compart, good to see you. Good to see you last night as well. Um, the Board of Animal Health protects livestock, protects the economic benefits, the whole thing and the expertise that Mr. Compart brings to that role, I hope means a very quick and unanimous uh, support for his confirmation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good, thank you, Senator Friends. And uh, members, I know uh, we're all uh, watching the avian, flu inf avian influenza uh, that we hope does not come to the, the upper Midwest, Minnesota, uh, but uh, Mr. Compart, I know you're uh, one of the key members that We'll keep watching over this. And uh, uh, I don't know if you have any comment on it right now. You do not need to comment on it. But if there's anything you think our committee knows, the uh, last I heard from Commissioner Peterson last Thursday was they had uh, now uh, confirmed a flock or flocks in Michigan. Uh, that's the closest it's gotten to us at this point in time. So uh, we just, uh, it's on the top of our minds and we just uh, hope and pray it doesn't, doesn't hit our state. Uh, um, yeah, any, any comment, Mr. Compart? Yes. Well, it's in the Mississippi Flyway, and that's where we are at right now, or that's where Minnesota is located. And, um, you know, we, we hope that, uh, you know, biosecurity efforts and, and ratcheting up some of the biosecurity efforts that people can do um, can help. Um, you know, we're fortunate to have a lot of animals that are going to be undercover uh, out of the way of uh, cross-contamination potentially. Uh, but then there's, uh, you know, there's... Uh, there's some that are not, and so there, it does create for opportunity uh, for that kind of interaction um, to, to, to make it happen. So, uh, so yeah, let's hope and pray that it does not uh, hit us and you know, we don't need a, a lot of other issues going on in the, 
you know, in agriculture in, or in, in the world right now either, you know, and we need to, you know, be, do everything we can to make sure and ensure that we uh, try to keep it as uh, healthy as possible. Very good. Other comments, members, any discussion? Having none, uh, members will uh, proceed to vote on the Dornick motion. All those in favor of the recommending the confirmation of Dean Comparts to the Board of Animal Health signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Congratulations, Mr. Compart. Uh, this is uh, passed out of the Agriculture Committee. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate yeah. your service. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, look forward to uh, working in the, here in the future. So thank Very you. Good. Thank you. Uh, uh, members, uh, next we'll bring up uh, next oh, up for our Confirmation is uh, Dr. Copian Fox, uh, Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I move to recommend confirmation of the appointment of Dr. Jessica Copian Fox to the Board of Animal Health. Members, uh, any discussion to that motion, uh, the Dames motion? You remember last week uh, she was one of the um, persons that we were interviewing and uh, from the Marshall area, I, I, I believe, right? And that is correct, that. Mr. Chair. And I'd just like to add that it's a very strong candidate and she's got an excellent background in the veterinarian field, including shrimp. Very good. Any further the discussion? Aquatic species. Any further discussion? Having no further discussion, all those in favor of the Dame's motion to recommend a confirmation of uh, Dr. Kopi and Fox say aye. Aye, aye. aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. Senator uh, Goggin, uh, one more uh, member uh, for confirmation, uh, Dr. Hawkins uh, from the Northfield area. Uh, go ahead, Senator Goggin. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to recommend confirmation of the appointment of Dr. Peggy Ann Hawkins to the Board of Animal Health. Members, discussion to uh, Dr. Hawkins. Confirmation. Any further discussion? Having none, uh, members, all those in favor of the Goggin motion uh, to confirm, uh, recommend confirmation of uh, Dr. Hawkins to the Board of Animal Health, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, members. And uh, that would conclude our uh, confirmation uh, part of the agenda for today. And uh, members, we're gonna move into uh, hearing uh, two, two bills. Uh, Senator Dames, if uh, you wanna go up and present uh, both bills. Senator Dames, uh, Senator Dames moves uh, the passage, or moves uh, SF 2936 uh, be recommended to pass and laid over for possible and Oh, and we referred to the taxes committee. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Tell us about your bill, Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, if you recall, a couple of years ago, we passed the uh, sales tax exemption for county fairs on their revenues of their tickets to the gate tickets and proceeds from that end of it. That was determined by the Minnesota Department of Revenue that that would only be exempt for the sale for the tickets sold at the gate during the day of the fair. So what this bill does is it changes that so that any tickets sold prior to the day of the fair are also sales tax exempt. And then also that bill, this bill clarifies that the money goes to the Agricultural Society. Currently the bill says goes to the Agricultural Society or the owner of the fairgrounds. We have uh, some fairgrounds that are not owned by the counties are owned by the Ag Society. So this uh, says that the money would go directly to the Ag Society, but it keeps in the bill the things they have to use it for and things like that, that stays the same. Uh, it just makes it cleaner and uh, makes the money so that they know what's coming and know what they can use it for. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to our testifier, A.J. Dewar. 
Mr. Dewar, uh, welcome to our committee. Uh, identify yourself for the record and uh, tell us a little more about the bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Andrew Dewar, and I'm here today representing the Minnesota Federation of County Fairs. I'd like to also thank uh, uh, Senator Dames for bringing this bill forward today. Uh, as Senator Dames said, uh, Senate file uh, 2936 makes a couple of small changes to the uh, sales tax exemption that was passed in uh, Senator Chamberlain's 2019 tax bill. And, and before I get into the, the, the changes, I, I would just wanna let the committee know that that, that exemption is working very well. Um, I've talked to many county ag societies, whether it's visiting them at their county fairs or talking to them at our annual convention in January. And each one has said that uh, this sales tax exemption has allowed them to make significant improvements to their fairgrounds. Uh, but in talking to all those county ag societies, a couple of issues kept popping up that we're, we're hoping to address today. And as Senator Dame said, section one of the bill um, keeps the realized uh, sales tax exemption, the funds with the county ag society, uh, regardless of who owns the fairgrounds. And in Minnesota, uh, roughly half of the uh, county egg societies own the fairgrounds and the other half, roughly half, are owned by uh, local government, most often uh, the county, but there are a couple of municipal owned uh, fairgrounds. And this doesn't so much fix a problem as it creates an efficiency. Our, our county egg societies get along really well with their counties and cities. So, but what I, what I kept hearing is, uh, they come forward to me and they're like, well, we're not sure. We just send it to the county. So they send it back to us uh, because it's really the county egg society that's the entity that uh, maintains and improves the fairgrounds. Uh, and section two, uh, also uh, Senator uh, Dames described it well. Uh, it was really an oversight on our, our part when we drafted the bill uh, last time around. And that uh, what the legislature wanted to do in 2019 was just exempt sales made by county egg societies for the purposes of holding the fair because a lot of county egg societies do make other sales throughout the year. Uh, typically it's renting out space for events or storage. And uh, those sales would still remain subject to the sales tax under this bill. But what this bill does <coughs> is it allows uh, sales made for admission to the fair or, or grandstand events and things like that. Uh, sales that were made prior to the fair uh, exempt from the sales tax, but the event, it has to be either admission to the fair or an event that takes place during the fair and on the fairgrounds. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I'd uh, be happy to stand for any questions and uh, also have uh, somebody else from the Federation here that can uh, help answer any questions as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dewar. Um, does your other witness, do you want them to testify or are they just here for questions if they come up? Uh, Mr. Chair, I think you're just here for questions. Very good. Members, are questions? Mr. Dewar, uh, can you just touch a little bit more on the, the second part about the money that goes to other entities that may own technically the, the, the fairgrounds, but doesn't pass through to the, to the ag society? Is, is, that, is that the case in every county that it's an ag society that runs and takes care of the fair? Or is there, is there other situations? And just talk about that, that that pass through in that situation a little bit more so we can understand that uh, a sure. little further. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so in, in about half of the instances when the, the county egg society owns the fairgrounds, uh, this bill really wouldn't have any effect on them because uh, the, 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 so that the, the sales that the county egg society would make um, would remain with the county egg society. Uh, but it would still have the, the uh, requirement in this, in the previous bill and in this bill, that the money is used for uh, maintenance, expansion, improvement of the fairgrounds. But uh, what we were running into is when, um, when we had a, a fairground that was, was owned by a county or a city, um, it wasn't a problem so much as it was the money was, the, the, the county egg society was wondering, well, do we, the, the county and the city would want it to end up with the egg society anyways to make those improvements because that's the entity that would do it so like do we have to send it to them just so they send it back to us and what this bill uh would do is it just kind of gets rid of that whole question and and the the funds would stay with the county egg society but the funds would still uh, be required to be used uh for maintenance and improvement of the fairgrounds very good thank you mr Dewar. senator goggin thank you mr chair uh <clears throat> mr Dewar, i was just curious are counties selling uh, tickets advance in advance online at all? Or are they doing it based on 
you know, going around town and selling the people on the street. I'm just curious to see if, what the online sales is and what the potential for that is. If you could uh, give us a little information on that, I'd appreciate it. Mr. Doerr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Goggin. Uh, uh, both, uh, I've heard from County Ag Society is that they do do pre-sales for tickets to the fair and for tickets to grandstand events, both online and just around town. And and uh, right now, the uh, the way that the unless, if this bill doesn't doesn't go into effect, those those pre-sales uh, would be subject to the sales tax. But if this passed, they wouldn't, because the current statute says that the sale must be made on one of the days of the county fair. Uh, and what this bill would allow is. Um, a pre-sale would also be exempt as long as the event takes place during the fair and on the fairgrounds. Mr. Chair, could I also comment? Senator Dames, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Goggin. As an old fair board member, you have your, your, your gate tickets at the, day of the, at the days of the fair and that they're more costly than if you pre-buy those tickets. And so what is happening is we're finding with, uh, used to be not too many fairs had an entrance fee. Now most fairs have an entrance fee. We used to have a lot of free fairs, but as the cost of things have been driven up and the cost of maintenance stuff, those numbers have went up as far as the cost for that ticket. So we're seeing a lot more people wanting to pre-buy because of the fact that that ticket is a cheaper price. And so this is one way to capture that sales tax so that these, uh, these uh, ag societies can use that money to maintain their, their premises. Even though they don't own the premises, usually they're responsible to maintain them. And so that's uh, uh, why we want to have that included for prepay. And then the second part of it is with the, uh, with the uh, money sometimes going to the owner of the fairgrounds, I guess I have a little concern that uh, you have uh, certain entities that own these fairgrounds, such as counties or cities. Most of them are county owned fairgrounds. And so they're used to designating so much money in your annual budget to give to the Ag Society to do the fair. And so if these sales tax are going over to some of these counties, I have a concern that they're gonna take the sales tax, put it in their coffers and not increase the amount that they're giving to the county fair to provide the fair. And the purpose of this was to get more money for the county fairs to maintain their premises and keep those premises safe and things like that for the fairgoers. So just, uh, just another way to make sure that happens and make that process follow up better. Any follow-up, Senator Goggin? Uh, no, no, Mr. Chair, I do not. Any other discussion members? Other questions? Uh, Senator Dames, uh, any final comments? Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members for hearing the bill. And uh, I would appreciate uh, this bill goes to the tax committee. So I would appreciate the, uh, your support of this bill and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. S Senator uh, Dames renews his motion to pass SF 2936 and we refer it to the tax committee. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. Very good. Senator Dames, uh, next bill, uh, Senator Dames uh, moves 20, SF 2937 for consideration and to be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, today I have Senate file 2937, Senate file 2937 request a appropriation uh, for the uh, Veterinary Di Diagnostic Laboratory Equipment. And that request is for $1.5 million. And uh, the purpose of that request is for the Diagnostic Lab to take that money and purchase more equipment. And, uh, you know, there's always concerns about diseases that are uh, coming up or we've, uh, are, are in other states and things like that. So we wanna make sure we're very vigilant and that we have the wherewithal when that starts coming to Minnesota to deal with it. And so uh, uh, today we're asking for that request. And as you heard uh, Dean Car Compart talk a little about the avian flu and stuff, we're in that flyaway and there's some concerns, but it's not just the avian flu, it's several other things. So certainly concerned. So uh, uh, Mr. Chair, at this time, if we would uh, turn it over to 
Dr. Torreson uh, from the university to uh, as a testifier on the bill. Oh, very good. Uh, thank you, Senator Dames. And Dr. Torreson, uh, you're joining us by Zoom. Uh, welcome and uh, identify yourself for the record and uh, uh, you may proceed. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I apologize. I was not, I did not look over to my right to see who came up to the table. Oh. I apologize. Uh, uh, Dave Preisler is at the table to testify and he's the uh, CEO of the Minnesota Pork Producers. And Dave, I apologize for not, uh, not a problem. checking Dr. that Torreson, out. You go first. And, and um, my understanding, uh, Senator Dames, is Dr. Torreson will start, but Mr. Preisler, is that your understanding too? Uh, yes, that's my understanding. Okay, okay. so we'll, we'll come to you, Mr. Preisler, after Dr. Torreson. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us. Dr. Uh, Torreson. Thank you, Chair Westrom and members of the committee. Can you hear me okay? Uh, we can, maybe if you get just a little closer, it could be better, but it, it's coming through, but. Okay. There, that's even better. All right. Well, my name is Welcome. Dr. Jerry. Hello. Welcome, I said. Yep. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, so my name is Dr. Jerry Torreson and I am the director of the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab at the University of Minnesota. I would much prefer being there in person, but um, I'm also in Indianapolis at the national meeting of the American Association of Swine Veterinarians. So I appreciate the chance to join remotely. And I'd also like to thank Senator Dames for bringing this bill forward today. The Veterinary Diagnostic Lab is a key part of the infrastructure that protects and promotes the health of animals and agriculture in the state. While we serve all animals and animal segments, 97% of our laboratory procedures and 93% of our clinical revenue came from livestock and poultry cases in fiscal year 21. So this funding is truly directed towards serving the needs of animal agriculture in Minnesota. As has been mentioned, cases of avian influenza in multiple states in recent weeks reinforced the need for a diagnostic laboratory that is adequately equipped and staffed. We are certainly better prepared now than we were in 2014 because of investments the state has made in facilities and equipment. And this additional funding will help us sustain that preparedness. Funding will be used to purchase equipment that builds on the investment from two years ago to increase our surge capacity for testing and disease outbreak events and also improve our day-to-day -day operating efficiency. Funds will be used to upgrade aging equipment that wastes supplies and reagents, to add new equipment for new tests, such as the RT Quick Test for CWD, and to replace some equipment such as autoclaves that were installed when the laboratory was built 30 years ago and are now due to be replaced. The equipment requested includes items from all the laboratory sections, which will help us retain our laboratory accreditation, as well as provide the types and timing of services our clients require. A list of equipment planned for purchase was submitted and I appreciate your consideration of this. Thank you, Dr. Torreson. Uh, uh, members, why don't we go to Mr. Preisler and then we'll open it up for questions uh, of, of either testifier. Uh, Mr. Preisler, uh, welcome to our committee. Uh, please identify yourself for the record. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Westrom and members of the committee. My name is David Preisler and I'm with the Minnesota Pork Producers Association and we're uh, based out of Mankato. Uh, I'm here to ask for your support for Senate File 2937 and thank you, Senator Dames, for authoring the bill. We've also received uh, permission to share that there's a much longer list of supporters, including both the Minnesota Farmers Union and Farm Bureau, uh, the Cattlemen's Association, Minnesota Turkey Growers, Minnesota Chicken and Egg, Minnesota Milk, and the farm credit systems that serve our state, and others. Uh, disease is a part of raising animals, uh, no matter the size or species or style of farm that, that a uh, specific farmer has. Uh, but there are a number of key elements of management that farms employ, including biosecurity, vaccination, and testing uh, to prevent and to treat diseases. Um, as you heard from Dr. Torson, an important part of our infrastructure is our states, uh, or for our state's livestock farmers, is the veterinary diagnostic lab. Um, it's commonly used to test animals uh, prior to movement, especially breeding stock, um, and also to, to uh, monitor the status of disease it's also critical in the event of a foreign animal disease. We also have use of the lab to help us manage antimicrobial resistance. So we can track those things long-term and then make interventions appropriately depending on what we're finding at the lab. 
Many of you have heard of um, African swine fever. Um, it's something that's a tremendous concern for us. Um, for the first time in about 40 years, it's been found in the Western Hemisphere, um, sitting down in Haiti in the Dominican Republic at this point in time. Um, the USDA has been extremely helpful in putting additional resources into border inspections and border security. And again, we appreciate that in order to prevent that disease from getting here because whenever you're managing disease, prevention is our first and best defense. Uh, however, it's, uh, it's important that we've got a lab that would be able to have surge capacity in case that disease got here. And uh, not only this lab, but other labs across the United States. And this lab is hooked in with a national um, a group of labs that also work with USDA and are certified to do so. Um, it's really important that we've got you know, publicly available labs for testing and the ability to interpret the test results for the benefit of veterinarians, farmers, and the general public in the case of a zoonotic disease. In the event of a foreign animal disease, the only way to move animals in what's called a control zone is to first of all test them. Okay? So we need to have that capability. We need the ability for accurate, timely testing uh, capabilities in normal times, and then also, like I mentioned, if challenged by a form of animal disease. And volume and capacity matters. And so really one of the key things that you get with this, uh, with this bill and this new investment is more volume and capacity for, for the lab to turn things over. It's also important for all of you to understand that farms do pay fees for the testing work that happens. Okay, this is not a freebie for them. Um, it's something that they pay, it's a part of their budget. Um, and what we're asking for though, is equipment that can, can even make that lab better. So in closing, um, our ask today is invest in upgrades of equipment at the veterinary diagnostic lab. Uh, Dr. Torson has provided the details and, and we trust that that investment will not only make the lab stronger, but an even better asset for the state. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Preisler. Um, First question I have just for you or uh, Dr. Torreson, whoever uh, feels most equipped, you, you'd mentioned about uh, a lot of this equipment is just to make the testing faster. Um, can you compare or contrast this versus the last investment of 600 and some thousand dollars that uh, we put in? And that sounds similar to what we were funding then. Uh, is this some of the same equipment or I recall then uh, the, the need for that up, upgrade was going to exponentially allow tests to be uh, uh, processed quicker and turn around quicker. Um, how does this fit into that? And how much of that is uh, stuff that, uh, how much faster can we go? I guess uh, I thought that's largely what we were funding last time. But if you can just expand on that, uh, Mr. Preisler or Dr. Torres, and uh, that'd be helpful, I think, for us to understand. <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, I would defer to Dr. Torson first of all, and then I can also vouch because I just saw the equipment a couple of weeks ago that was put in and how this is actually different. But Dr. Torson will give a much better answer than I will. Very good, Dr. Torson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, that's a great question. Uh, yes, uh, certainly we, we want to acknowledge that uh, the investment from two years ago was uh, put to use and the equipment is there and, and available for, for tours, uh, but it's, it's the next step that we're asking money for in terms of the Quant Studio Pro 6 PCR machines, not to get too technical, but it's a two-step process. So there is first an extraction step where all of the samples come in and have to be sent through these liquid handler robotics. And so the investment from the last uh, session was to help us become much more efficient in preparing samples and, and through the first step of the PCR process. What we're asking for now is to replace equipment that we have in, in, installed already with new equipment that has more flexibility. And so uh, when we wanna talk about capacity, uh, currently the, the machines that we have, they're called 7500s, are in a 96 well plate format. These new machines can either do 96 wells, which would be what we would use for day-to-day -day operations, or we can convert them to 384 uh, well plates. So we can quadruple our capacity for the PCR testing just by switching the formats. And so on a day-to-day -day operating standpoint, there's no benefit there because that's not the volume we're dealing with. But in particular, as we're looking at something like African swine fever, 
the modeling that has been done for the number of samples that would be required to be tested is quite extraordinary. And so we're asking for this equipment to expand our surge capacity by having this flexibility to switch to a higher throughput format. So uh, if, if that helps explain it, uh, I hope it does. If it doesn't, I'm happy to uh, take more questions on that, Mr. Chair. It, it does, uh, Dr. Torreson. And uh, I, I think to clarify some of the stuff you, some of the equipment you talked about replacing uh, isn't the stuff that you just bought. It's other equipment that, that, that this would be replacing that wasn't updated recently, if I'm assuming, correct? Uh, Mr. Chair, that's correct, yes. Um, the, the equipment that was recently installed and in, is in place is state-of-the-art equipment for robotic handling. This new equipment, in some cases, replaces machines that, have, that are 20 years old, frankly, and, and uh, still functioning. I, I don't want to give the impression that we're not able to respond to any of these potential outbreaks, but looking ahead, there's much more flexibility and much more capacity with these next generation uh, pieces of equipment that uh, again, give us more flexibility and capacity. So it's, it's our way of being able to stay ahead of the curve with the new technologies uh, and uh, again, expand our capabilities. Thank you, uh, Senator French. And then other questions members after that? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Dames, for bringing this forward. Mr. Preisler, we're still talking about a pork industry that on an annual basis brings in over a billion dollars in Minnesota, is that right? Mr. Preisler. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Frentz, actually, as far as farm gate value, we're, this year it won't, we'll get real close to $3 billion okay. um, that will actually come back into farmers' pockets. And if, Mr. Senator Chair, Frentz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Pricer. And if we have an outbreak of African swine fever, what kind of impact could that have on that dollar figure? Uh, Mr. Pricer. Uh Mr. Chair, Senator Frentz, um, it would make what we went through in 2020 um, with COVID and slowdowns and that sort of thing um, look like a cakewalk. Um, so we export, the United States exports about 30% of all the pork produced in the United States. And, um, and if you end up being positive for African swine fever and a couple of other diseases, foot and mouth disease, classical swine fever, your export status immediately goes away, okay? So it would mean we would have literally 30% more product than we would really know what to do with um, until you could work through that sort of a situation. So it would be catastrophic from a standpoint of prices um, and so you can take that, uh, that $3 billion figure and you could run that down to a billion pretty quickly, um, which would obviously be substantial for, for rural Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any follow up, Senator French? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Pricer. So uh, we use the word conservative sometimes in the Senate, and I would just suggest to members that if we're gonna be conservative in protecting pork production in Minnesota, then these kinds of expenses seem like money well spent. Uh, we don't want to have that type of outbreak like Mr. Preisler's talking about, where we could have an impact of hundreds of millions of dollars. And what we're having here is testimony that says that this is the kind of investment that can prevent that. Even if it only prevented 1%, we would be glad we spent this money. And I think Mr. Preisler's testimony is telling us we have a lot more at risk. So conservative, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds like a good... Line from a lawyer. <laughs> Good twist. <laughs> but Mr. Preisler, to that point, um, or, or, or Mr. Torres, and uh, Senator French does bring up a good point, too. You have a virus like that. Uh, how, how important is the need for speed to respond? And uh, that's part of what this, this investment does, uh, means, means responses in hours instead of days or days instead of weeks. Uh, can you just expand on that a little bit more to impress, I guess, upon us the importance of, of what it does or how does it contribute to uh, uh, some virus that might hit uh, in, in responding to it? I can maybe start and Dr. Torson can back clean up. Um, Mr. Chair, I'd say the, when we talk about speed, one of the things that, that ends up being important is, first of all, in this virus, it's got a really long incubation period which unfortunately means it could be all over the place before we actually find it, okay? Which would be troubling, which makes it 
even more important to have capacity to test because it could theoretically be all over. And before we would actually kind of see clinical signs and, and so on. And I mentioned before that, you know, you, if you do have a foreign animal disease and it's diagnosed on a specific farm, there would be a control zone that would be established around that farm. You'd have a quarantine on that farm. But then within that control zone, all the animals prior to being tested, in this case, pigs, would need to be tested before they could move, okay? So they may be, may not have the disease, but in order to make sure that we're not spreading it around, we need to test all of those animals within that control zone. And so if, for example, that, that happens in a very remote part of the state where there's only one or two hog farms, well, that's probably not a big deal, okay? But if you're in Nicollet County, that's a big deal because there are, there's a lot of hog farms there. Um, and so as you draw that control zone circle, you're going to envelop more farms. And so as you're gonna be looking at moving animals, we, we can't move them, period, for two reasons. One, by law. And second of all, just by common sense, you don't wanna spread the disease, okay? And so we need to have that capacity that's built up in case it comes to be able to still operate business-wise, have some sort of continuity of business. And then also just to have the capacity to confirm what's going on on farms as you clean farms up, to come back in and do environmental testing to make sure that we've truly gotten rid of it. Um, so it's that's why the capacity becomes important. And also to have you know the kind of equipment that can give you the results that you need and the quality of people that are at that lab that, that you're really sure on the results that are coming through and the interpretation of it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Preissler. Um, Dr. Torreson, any additional comment on that? And then Senator, uh, another question. Uh, thank you, Chair Westrom. Yes, uh, certainly uh, Dave Preissler's comments are, are absolutely valid. I'd add uh, a couple other twists. Um, we also want to talk about sustainability, and, and by that I mean being able to sustain a response in case it goes for a long time. And that goes back to the, the people that can really get worn out if there are extensive manipulations of samples that have to be done. And so, uh, again, appreciating the, the commitment of the state to supply the robotics equipment during the last uh, session or, or the last biennium, uh, that was a huge step forward. This other equipment builds on that again in that it's, uh, 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 it's more complex to manage the equipment, but the manipulations are simpler, if that makes sense. And so there's, there's a, 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 there, these are smarter instruments that are able to do more things and related to the continuity of business. Uh, for example, during the High Path AI event in 2015, we had an additional 18,000 samples that came through and we sustained all of our other additional testing at the same time. And these uh, new pieces of equipment give us greater flexibility so that we can run more than one type of test on a plate at a time so that all the other testing that we still want to do in order for people to be able to maintain the health of their farms in unaffected areas, can we can accomplish that through this more uh, uh, sophisticated equipment. So um, if that helps explain the, the, the need or the uh, objective. Thank you, Dr. Torres. And uh, Senator Dornick has a question. Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Torreson and Mr. Pressler. I, my question is with the kind of exciting to see the CWD equipment. And we've had quite a few um, hearings on that. So if you could tell me a little bit about that equipment and the accuracy of it and uh, just how that's going to be used in the, in the field. Dr. Torreson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Dornick. Uh, so the uh, RT Quick uh, technology is uh, being refined and, and is showing great promise. There's been a lot of work that has been done to show the value of it in terms of sensitivity and specificity. And so it appears to be uh, the, the next technology that will uh, find a place for characterizing the the status of cervids in terms of CWD uh, with the advantage that it can be an anti-mortem test as well as a post-mortem test. And so 
the anticipation of it being approved by USDA is uh, driving us to want to acquire the equipment so that we can get it in place, uh, get people trained on it, and uh, the anticipated uh, approval from USDA would then uh, provide protocols and proficiency testing panels that we would be able to use uh, for getting our people certified to provide the test and then we would be able to provide that as a service to the uh, producers and, and uh, hunters of the state. And Dr. Torreson, uh, follow up to that. Uh, these these tests would be some of the first in the in the nation or first in the state. Uh, how how would they this equipment uh, work with doing a live test and and how how does it get us to the point where we have a a, a valid live test option on on CWD for either the wild deer or uh, or uh, uh, fenced farming uh, deer that are that are on farms. Uh, if you could expand on that a little bit, uh, just for us to understand that, because a live test seems to be a real uh, gateway to to some better ways to manage uh, deer farms or wild deer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The USDA is working right now on the first step of, uh, or the, 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 the first use, the first intended use that they're validating is a, a live sample that's a rectal biopsy sample that has been used for immunohistochemistry testing, but now it's being uh, evaluated in this test. And so um, it would be able to be, uh, once validated, uh, deer could be sampled and submitted, samples could be submitted uh, and it would be a fully validated test that USDA has approved that we could run in our lab as part of this National Animal Health Laboratory Network that Dave Chrysler was mentioning. And so, uh, in fact, the, the first step would be a, a sample from live deer. The second, from what I understand, the second set of samples that would be validated uh, later at some point would be uh, samples from uh, deceased deer or dead deer. And uh, those are the only samples we can currently test by immunohistochemistry or ELISA testing. Uh, and so uh, we, other, we have already other options right now for that, but uh, the expectation is that that would follow closely on the heels of the live animal samples. Senator Dornick, did you have a follow-up? No, Mr. Chair. No, Senator Goggin, then, then Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just going to follow up with uh, <clears throat> what Senator Dornick was asking on CWD, uh, but change that to the avian influenza, what we have, uh, how we're going to uh, be testing and uh, working on mitigating aviation, avian influenza, uh, either Dr. Torreson or uh, Mr. Priestley. Dr. Torreson, uh, can you talk to us about this equipment and any crossover or cross purpose? use uh, with, with avian influenza and any testing or response to that? Uh, uh, Senator Goggin's question. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Goggin. The uh, PCR machines are absolutely suited for testing for avian influenza. And so those, again, would flow into the liquid handling equipment that we've already received. Uh, the, just a little more history Following the Hyopath avian influenza event back in 2015, the state supported the expansion of our uh, poultry testing laboratory in Wilmer. Uh, and so there was, uh, we increased the size of it fourfold and also established PCR testing capacity out there. So now we have two laboratory locations able to provide the official testing by PCR for avian influenza. And most of the testing that's been done since the lab was set up in Wilmer for PCR testing has in fact been done in Wilmer, but we can test in both locations. And so the new equipment, uh, these PCR machines would be located in St. Paul at our veterinary diagnostic lab next to the fairgrounds and would expand our capacity. We don't think we'll probably get to the point where we would 
exceed the, the current capacity for avian influenza testing just because the number of samples are not as high as they would be with, for example, an African swine fever event. Uh, but the equipment would absolutely be used in that event uh, if it was needed for testing in St. Paul. So uh, does that answer the question? Senator Goggin, any follow-up? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, that did answer my question. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Uh, uh, Torson, uh, Dr. Torson, uh, the equipment that you're uh, asking for, some of this is replacement for uh, like the autoclaves and of course computers, it seems like we are replacing computer systems, uh, workstations almost every two years or three years, four years. What's the life expectancy of most of this equipment that you're asking for? Dr. Torreson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson. That's, that's a great question. And that, and that question came up two years ago as well. Uh, and and I, I, I tried to be forthright and say, there could be leapfrog, tech, leapfrog technology that makes all of this outdated in a year, but more likely uh, probably a 10 year horizon for these new platforms that we're looking at. There are uh, new technologies coming forward. Obviously uh, it was a bit of a, uh, I don't wanna call it a Manhattan Project moment, but it was, it was certainly accelerated with the pandemic that a lot of people are looking at new technologies uh, for infectious disease diagnostics. Uh, but today at this national meeting, I met with uh, the vendor of, of this equipment and I asked her that exact same question. And I said, um, you know, are, are we looking at being outdated in three or four years? And she said, you're on the path for uh, a long, uh, <laughs> a long life with this equipment because uh, this technology is, is the newest and uh, we expect that for high throughput situations, which is again, what we're dealing with, that this will be the technology that will be in place for a long time. And so to me, a long time is more than five years and, and probably closer to 10 years. The equipment that we're replacing, again, some of it is up to 20 years old now. So uh, that's been the time horizon, but it's more accelerated with more uh, test development. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any follow up? Any follow up? No. No, sir. All right. Members, uh, any other questions? Uh, Dr. Torreson, just timing. Uh, what, what kind of timeline would you be able to get this equipment in uh, once, if the funding uh, was passed? And um, is, is there uh, some items that, if, if, if all the funding wasn't available, some items that would be first on the list to get? Uh, just talk to us about the priority of, of, of some of it if the full 1.5 million wasn't available. And second, uh, what kind of timeline or supply chain shortages? Is there any delay uh, or problem in getting some of this equipment and, or how quick could you get it once the funding was secured? Um, Mr. Chair, that's, uh, that's another great question. It's, it's variable. And so um, again, in talking with the people on the PCR machines, um, there are some challenges. They are obviously highly sophisticated pieces of equipment that require computer chips. And I think everybody's familiar with the computer chip story. And so uh, if we ordered them today, it would be probably July that we would be able to get those. In terms of the RT quick, equipment. I've talked to the supplier on that, and that's about a six-week turnaround in terms of placing the order and being able to secure the equipment. Uh, some of the other equipment is, is more in stock, and so it would, you know, it would not be a long, a long wait for that, but in particular, the PCR machines appear to be the, the most susceptible to some of these supply chain issues. Uh, thank you, Dr. Torreson, but it sounds like everything within three, four or five months you probably could get once the funding is secured. Is that, is that kind of correct? Uh, Mr. Chair, with the exception of these PCR machines that, uh, you know, they're, <laughs> of course, they're working to get the chips as quickly as they can, but uh, for the rest of the machines, yes, that would be the case. So, so Mr. Tor Dr. Torreson, on the PCR, you talk about that uh, we all hear about PCR with COVID testing. Uh, 
are we talking the same PCR? Or, uh, what what does that stand for uh, for our committee? And is it is it a similar type equipment that could actually test for COVID uh, if if there was a similar outbreak as we've just seen uh, recently? Is that the same PCR test we're talking? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, exactly. The PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. It's just uh, um, if if I can use an analogy, um, we take the, the genetic material, so the DNA or RNA of a virus or a bacteria, and we make Xerox copies of it through this reaction in the PCR machine using varying levels of heat and cooling and, and uh, breaking up the genetic material and then uh, recombining it. And so if we start with one sheet of paper and we make 40 copies of it, at the end of it, we've got 40 copies of this. If we start with more virus, and so if we have a whole ream of paper, then we've got 40 reams of paper when we go through that number of cycles. And yes, um, in fact, we used our 7,500s that we would be replacing with these machines for COVID testing. We, uh, for a month, we were doing human samples and on demand, we are doing animal samples still to this day. And so it's exactly the same technology that everybody's been talking about for the last two years, absolutely. Thank you. Other questions, members? Um, having none, uh, Senator Dames, we'll just go back to you for any final comments and then remind members this bill is being laid over for possible inclusion. And uh, Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Certainly do appreciate uh, your willingness to hear Senate file 2937 today and want to thank the testifiers for taking the time out to uh, uh, share their information with us so that we got a little better handle on what this is all about. And I do think this is very important, uh, certainly a need, and it's very important that we uh, move, you know, get this taken care of. So uh, I understand you're going to lay it over, Mr. Chair. So thank you for doing that. Thank you, uh, Senator Dames, for bringing this forward. And uh, uh, Mr. Preisler, thank you for coming in and, and uh, sharing with our committee. And uh, Dr. Torreson, thank you. Uh, for joining us as well. Thank you for uh, taking time out of uh, your uh, trip into Indianapolis, which sounds like a, a well-rounded, uh, good trip and in information you're gathering. And so uh, thank you for, for your work on that um, and joining us here today. So members, uh, at this point, uh, we will lay Senate file 2937 over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. and. Uh, Members, no other business in front of us. That concludes our business for the day. The meeting is adjourned.